everyone. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Christopher Cottrell, an independent journalist, and I'm producing the Indo-Pacific Compass. Um, I'm in Bangkok, Thailand. Joining us today to discuss Philippine securities is a senior security analyst in Manila, Philippines, Carla Cruz. Uh, Carla Cruz, I met um, earlier this year when I was in the Philippines, understanding the situation with the Coast Guard, and I've had great conversations with Carla since then. So Carla, one, thank you for joining the show. And then secondly, can you tell the thank audience a little bit about yourself? I'm a senior security analyst in the Philippines. I am a fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. I focus mainly on um, emerging uh, domain threats and the use of uh, new technologies in the defense and security space. I'm a lecturer at the National Defense College, and I um, also train uh, uniformed personnel um, on emerging technologies. So it's a very interesting space to be in, especially in Manila. That's really fascinating. And um, can you tell us a little bit what happened recently with the storm that um, just the recent typhoon that hit the Philippines, and how is that raising security issues um, in Manila Bay with flooding and some of the land reclamation uh, of the islands that you and I just discussed? So you know we're actually in a bear in August. You know we're in a we're experiencing a late El Nino. Um, and not it, the storms, you know, typhoons coming through the Pacific are one thing and they're normal, but um, the the habaga, the, the monsoon season is being exacerbated by that. And, um, you know, we do experience a lot of flooding and, and landslides in a tropical country, but we've experienced um, flooding like we've never seen before. And I think that it's due to the increased um, reclamation activities in the Manila Bay and also off the coast of um, Zambales, which is where Subic Bay is actually located. So um, Manila Bay is, is right at the heart of the city um, in a, you know, it's a beautiful area. And, and, and when you look out now, you barely can see through um, the horizon because it's, it's all construction. So all of the sand is coming from various parts of um, the Luzon Island, um, maybe, you know, within a 500 uh, kilometer distance. And, um, you know, this is causing a lot of floods and, um, and you know, a lot of people to actually have been displaced um, from their homes. Okay. Um, earlier this week, the U.S. Embassy registered complaints about these um, islands being constructed, partly from connections with China. Can you comment a little bit about that and how that ties in with these uh, floods? So the ironic part, Chris, is um, the CCCC, which is a state-owned um, uh, construction company, was the one who was blacklisted by the World Bank um, and were the ones who were building the, uh, the islands in the spread. So they're the company that was awarded the contract to, um, to dredge and to reclaim these areas of Manila Bay. So these are obviously security concerns for the U.S. and the Philippines as well, because, um, you know, they're operating with uh, unsound business practices, first of all. And, um, you know, they, they built these artificial islands that encroach in our, ter in our territories. And that's been, you know, widely discussed as, as well as the hate group. Um, how are these licensed and how did, uh, what kind of, um, you know, is this like a national bid or is this a local Manila bid? W what are these bids about and how do they get the licenses for them? Okay, so from the, the Philippine government is structured in a federal way, but without a federal, in the absence of a, a form of federal. So the local governments have a lot of discretion, um, especially when it comes to uh, foreign funded uh, development projects, which this would fall under. Um, okay. And so the permits would have come from the local government, the city of Manila, during the previous mayor, um, Asco Moreno, without really considering the environmental um, uh, concerns of that would, you know, the, the of questions of what have which come up from a national level. Um, they, funny, they built a, uh, an artificial beach that um, it, right beside the, the embassy as well during the time, and, and it has never been used because you know that there were there weren't no proper studies done with the flow in the movement of water, and it becomes just attachment for um, garbage. So you know, I think that there needs to be some serious policy review around um, you know 
this this situation and and for it, especially for large projects like this. Do you see the national government stepping in at this point, or are their hands bound? Actually, you know, it's funny because we have a very um, strong environment natural resources secretary, and she has been very proactive in um, raising concern about this. Now, you know, we obviously, it, it all come, falls down to what the strategy of the national government is. And it seems that more than security, we're focused on um, economic recovery um, and somehow forgetting that, that the environment plays a huge part in, in a sustained economic recovery. Okay, yeah, so it, it would seem if these islands are causing like devastating floods to downtown and other parts, that would be, <laughs> have a, a a very very bad economic impact is that what, what we're seeing do we have any figures on the damages Correct. um i think the uh the latest count was about three hundred thousand people would be permanently displaced in these coastal towns and mind you we're in an archipelago of seven thousand islands right the way we live is very similar to the hawaiian people the way they live beside the, of the by the coast um you know and and the rest of the islands uh, along the pacific we re they rely on um you know on the on these waters for their livelihood and and to feed them so you know they're left without a choice but to go into the city that's already overpopulated so you, you're dealing with that as well um rather than going further out and encouraging um uh, you know uh, increasing our our agriculture, um, you know, uh, ex, um, ec economic activities. Um, is this th then really impacting coastal erosion with, um, you know, damages to reefs and fisheries as well? When you're talking about agricultural Definitely. damage to land, okay. Definitely. So the Philippines is um, home to several. Um, I think he. I'm obviously not a, a scientist, but um, he you know, areas of biodiversity. Um, Verde Island Pass, I believe is one that is that needs to be highlighted, I think, because a certain number of species live there and, and if they're if that's disturbed, um, the wider kind of um marine life and, and the ecological system does get damaged. And you know, secondly, we there's a lot of dynamite fishing that happens. Um, and so, you know, you, I'm not sure if you've seen the news, but we've had a lot of these bigger mammals that have floated up dead. Um, and and um, so there have been uh, whales, dugongs. Um, there have been, uh, you know, like, I think in Hawaii it happened and in Australia. So these waters are very close to each other. So there must be something happening that's disturbed underneath that is unnatural. Um, and so, you know, while technology plays a big part in advancing security and and um you know uh fishing and 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 um you know improving essentially and helping our fishermen and and that that industry i think we also need to look at what it means for for bio you know the bio um, uh, ecosystem yeah that's that's quite an impact the fishermen and the farmers uh are supposed to be having economic you know growth and the recovery are being damaged with a combination of, uh, uh, if you will, climate crisis, um, as well as these islands making uh, these false, false islands, if you will, or um, artificial islands. You know, Chris, um, I mean, yeah. something that I think I should mention also that's very important. Yeah. We, mm -hmm. we are island people. And when, you know, you can't fish in a certain area because an area, you don't want to overfish in, uh, um, you know, one part, you move to another state, right? But yeah. that's kind of been weaponized by, um, you know, by certain states, and that's had to be tagged as is illegal fishing. But really, I mean, you know, you you move from space to, to from place to place, given the temperature of the water, given the time of the year, and that's something that has happened for centuries, right? Um, and and that to protect, you know, our our livelihood and and the day to day. But to tell somebody they can't fish in a certain area because um that's their territorial domain. I mean. We have fished in Indonesian, Filipinos have fished in Indonesian waters, Malaysian waters, um, and Vietnamese waters for centuries without a hitch and without being driven out, right? So we've had this community of all these islands for so many years. But why now are we being told that we can only fish in certain parts of, of the waters that, that have been shared for many years without a hitch? 
And when you're talking about these wires, are you specifically discussing the uh, West Philippine Sea and the nine dash line assertions? Yes, and I'm also discussing um, the uh, the Bashi Strait, Philippine Rice, which is very, very rich in, in you know bio marine biodiversity. Um, that's where you get these large clams. Um, tuna is fished in the eastern seaboard of the Philippines, all the way to um, to the uh, to Papua New Guinea. So imagine from Mindanao, northern Mindanao, from General Santos, all the way across the Pacific, you get this beautiful tuna that's, I mean, you know, shared. I mean, it's part of a shared economy within the Pacific Rim that, that has been going on again for decades, you know, fish, these, um, the, the trade of, of, um, of, of, uh, of, um, uh, the marine, you know, marine rich resources has been something that has sustained us for many years and now um it, it's been it's been um limited so it's so it's very very interesting and it's you know our our um our agriculture especially in marine agriculture has actually um has been cut in half in the last 10 right. years yeah yeah so you're really talking about um this coastal security really an increase there's been uh, more joint cooperation agreements yeah. the Philippines has been signing on the security issues that overlap up the U.S., Japan, Australia, uh, even France and EU are now really looking at coastal security, environmental security as one in the same. Can you comment on how some of these uh, multilateral um, agreements are have been unfolding in the last you know two or three months, like in a really rapid way? It has been actually. I think that. We've been a become a star of, of the darling of the region. The Philippines is you know, so interestingly at the center of it all. Um, but you know more than more than other countries taking an interest in in the region, obviously because you you know that that it, it interests them. I think I guess more than in a security way. I think it's in, in an economic way, right? But this is our home, and when you look at our history as Pacific Islands, and Pacific Islands meaning the archipelago stretching from the first um, island chain all the way down to, to the Philippines and then Indonesia into, you know, the Pacific Islands, Nauru, Solomons, um, uh, all the way to Papua New Guinea and, and, and Tahiti. Um, you know, we, we live a certain way, we share a certain set of values. I think we're the same people. That, if I'm not mistaken, I when I was looking this up, they found the DNA of, of native chickens in the Philippines, um, the same DNA in the chickens that they found all over the um, uh, the island chain, right? Um, we we live the same way. We have a very, I guess, um, protectorate approach to um, our people and our territory and, and what's important to us, but we're also not confrontational. We are such a, like a pacifist, um, you know, a uh, group of people, but we love our home, right? And we protect what's ours. And I think that that shared set of values, more than other people taking interest in that, I think it's time for us to come together as island, as an archipelago, and um, and protect that. Because it, it, it doesn't even have, it won't even need a long-winded discussion of, you know, what you get and the last actually it's like, hey, no, you know what? If you see something in front of you that is, is, is making you feel funny, you go, you take your boat and you say, hey, what's up, right? And, and you see what's going on and then you address it. But um, it, it is so innate and natural because it's what you see every day and what you live versus being so far away, really. And, and what is, you know, what do they need? Um, it's our lives every day that that is that are is on the line, right? So, I think that security is moving in a direction that we have to think about it as how do we come together as an archipelagic theater, um, when, within the Pacific Rim. Okay, when you you mentioned this archipelagic theater, um, what would your messages or comments mm -hmm. be for um, distant cousins in Hawaii? You've been to Hawaii many times, I know. Well. I know, I, and a hilo I love very dearly. It reminds me of my hometown, Cebu. Um, you know, more than a, 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 a spiritual and, and historical collect, connection, um, now technology actually connects us because we have 
data tables that go through the Pacific that run, I think, 97% of the data in the world. So imagine if one, one cable is severed. Um, access to information is, whether it's intentional or unintentional, um, can, can seriously, um, you know, interrupt our day-to-day -day lives. Our, it, it's what connects our, our, um, us to the rest of the world, but it's also what gives us um, some sense of security, right, that we're part of the rest of the world. And um, this is increasingly a space that is going to be challenged. Because, um, you know, this is what, what I think, you know, maybe I, I watched too much Oppenheimer, but it's what everybody had access to, you know, building a bomb. Everybody has access to the internet. And how do you, how do you then um, put that into play um, when you look at what can become, what can make a country insecure and that's cutting it off from the rest of the world? Okay, that's fantastic. Um, in terms of um, increasing this connectivity, if you will, um, again, using just a uh, look Hawaii, um, Indo-PACOM has had a very increased role in the Philippines in the last several months also, yes. um, and strengthening yes. relationships and friendships and partnerships with the Philippines. Can you comment a little bit more about what you've seen with that, that engagement and how the Philippines public is reacting to it? You know, um, CSIS ran a very interesting uh, survey, um, I think it was in 2020, about who they would rather be their big brother. And uh, the Philippines, and you know, during the President Duterte's time, there was a lot of bickering and, and a lot, you know, going on in the background. But you can't erase like 50 plus years of one of the strongest alliances that has, that is on, not just on paper, but built in, our, you know, within us, right? Um, it's been such a welcome, uh, a welcome development. So I think we've had, we've announced um, about nine bases. Um, most of them have been one concentrated really on humanitarian, um, bringing humanitarian relief to the communities um, in terms of, you know, in times of calamity, which is really tested now. Um, so up north, I'll give you an example, in Cagayan, it was, it was actually um, the governor had, had been very vocal about not welcoming them in. Because um, because of, of the number of bases and and you know maybe the security it would be it would attract more issues than uh, maybe it would help right but what happened you know in the last week we lost no one lost their lives yes they lost their homes but they were fed they were taken care of um, their psychosocial social needs were um, attended to because we had the assistance of our friends the U.S. If not, it would have been so hard to mobilize those resources. Um, second, we've actually, you know, been challenged to step up, I think, as a government, because we've had to improve our um, our policies and, and our, our accountability and to be able to stand side by side, essentially, with somebody that expects a lot of us as a partner. Um, I think that it's become a more fair partnership than it was looked at pre by previous generations. More than just technology transfer, we're seeing a lot more human capital development. So we're able to keep um, the, the, you know, the, the, develop, the growth here and, and maybe hopefully send um, on the way less Filipinos and keep them here where we need them. That was a really fascinating comment. Can you talk a little bit more about the human capital development and engagement with US? How's that, who's organizing that? What does that look like? Sure. like Sure. So um, because I think the Philippines has a lot more to offer in terms of developing maritime domain awareness technologies and, and um, you know, becoming a regional uh, physical hub, right? We have 7,000 islands that you have different topographies and terrains. So when you're looking at increasing maritime domain awareness and integrating different forms of deterrence now using technology and and humans and human intelligence. Um, I think that the Philippines will have a lot to offer again, because it goes back to, this is what we live day to day, right? Where do you install um, sonars and where do you, where do you gather information? Who do you gather the information from? It's these mm -hmm. people in the local governments where the bases are nearest that, you know, you, you, you will learn from. Um, okay. And so I think that 
those will be really those will, are going to be really um those are going to be really beneficial moving the economies and, and building a local defense posture and industry hopefully eventually um okay. as we grow this out when you're talking about the uh the the idea bases um these are philippines bases but the u.s is building in software within them and hardware and infra infrastructure that's correct right some people think that they're oh, fortifying them yes philippines bases okay no um, no they're philippine bases yes okay to clarify that because some people uh, uh yes. I, i've heard a variety of things well, we're building bases there so these are philippines bases actually first and foremost um yes are there other cooperations yes. Yes. um ongoing between the philippines and other other nearby states, Indonesia, for example, or Papua New Guinea, or any kind of island-centered um, coastal security collaborations that you're seeing develop? So we are actually um, uh, having our first naval um, uh, exercises with um, Indonesia. The Philippines and Indonesia are leading um, without any other nation, which is, which is very promising. I think that if the Philippines and Indonesia come together and see the power that they have, um, in the region and can can you know support our brothers and sisters in the Pacific, um, for them to join in and build their own maritime capabilities would be an amazing development. Um, I understand you know there are many Filipinos working and and living uh, within you know in Guam. I think half of Guam is Filipino and maybe even um, Hawaii. So um, that that already comes into play, right? So. More than just um, more than just naval exercises, I think building um, capacity and and helping human capital development in these islands um, to be led by by the Indonesia and the Philippines who've been around a little bit longer and a little bit more mature and in what's needed would be a would be really good to start a conversation. About. That's fascinating. You mentioned why Guam Filipino <laughs> workers, lots of Indonesian workers. Um, and you're saying this done. Uh, you're saying on the naval level is military to military, but what about like civilian coastal yeah. uh, exchanges, coast guards? Um, so I understand. From what I understand, uh, there's some um, an international fusion center in Singapore, um, and a, a national coast watch center here in the Philippines, and these are actually being built out all throughout the Pacific. Um, I'm talking about it from a technology perspective because that's really okay. what I appreciate. Other than building kinetic um, and and you know kind of uh, hardware, right? So okay. what's important in moving into the future is the exchange of information and how we turn that into actionable intelligence so we can make better decisions on how to move forward. Um, so establishing these information centers, so from Singapore to the Philippines, and then I believe Papua New Guinea and Indonesia have them. Is um, you know so we can all gather our data and collaborate on how to address this problem together rather than in silos. Um, so this is part of the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Program that was established by the Quad, and um, so it's strongly supported by Australia and Japan um, on a more local level. But you know, building these information fusion fusion centers, I think, are the way to go um, without having to put boots on the ground and and put people's lives. So you mentioned these information fusion centers and the quad mechanism. Mm -hmm. How does the Philippines participate within mm -hmm. the quad mechanism? Or how I would think it? The Philippines is I, like. I think the Philippines is um, uh, the little brother that's there all the time um, for, 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 his, for, you know, for Japan and Australia. And I think that, but I think the Philippines is going to step up very soon, especially again, with this, with this human capital development value that we bring to the table everybody else benefits from the from from who the filipino is and how ingen how ingenious the filipino is in service um and and you know running critical infrastructure all around the world but you know in times of crisis i think people need to come home right and and you'll see that more and more so um the the indo-pacific maritime domain awareness um, programs will not only uh, capacitate civilian um, uh, uniform personnel, but also um, the military. Fantastic. Um, you are sometimes a technical advisor to the Philippines uh, military. What, what are some of your messages to them about all of these uh, converging trends and uh, ideas? 
I think, okay, well, that's a really interesting question. You know, it's, it's nice to have all the time. So nice to have, right? But these things get old, they get rusty. In the end, what matters is building your people and their um, ability to withstand whatever is thrown their way. Right? I've seen it here because we've had very little and I've seen what's, what they can build with just a laptop. Um, you know, so rather than spending money on things that depreciate really fast, I said, let's put money back into our people, ask them to come home and, and give them something to look forward to, to fight for. Um, that we as a nation need to come together and be proud of. Yeah, that's fantastic, Carla. Uh, do you have any sort of parting words of wisdom about how uh, the world can look at the Philippines going forward for the rest of this year, if you will, with coastal security, technology, and human capacity building? So the Philippines, I, I, I joke, our Fili the Philippines exports people, right? We, we are a great source of human capital. Um, but at the end of the day, we also need to respect the human being. And in line with that, I think that the world needs to help us stay accountable for how we treat our people and our justice system. Because as we come into a world that's a little bit more gray and um, irregular in what we, in, in how we fight and how we, how we uh, you know, how conflict essentially is um, rooted in. Uh, what goes back to this is, is people looking at human rights and making human rights just as important as economic growth and, and protecting our territory. I think that all goes hand in hand. So, you know, if, if, if there's something that I think the Philippines and, and I think this region needs to see is how wonderful and how beautiful their people are. And if people could only see what an, an amazing life we live and we need to, you know, we need to protect, um, they'll understand why we'll fight so hard to keep it that way. Okay, you convinced me. I'm buying my ticket next month. I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> I am overdue. Uh, Carla Cruz, there's so many more things we could uh, discuss, and I look forward to having you back on the Indo-Pacific Compass and Think Tech Hawaii. Um, you're an incredible person, and your mind is very, very fantastic. So thank you for your time thank and you. for the audiences. Thank, um, thank you for watching, and we'll be, um, we'll be back next month. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.